uh, to the uh, September 15th edition of the Architectural Review Board. Can we start with the roll call, please? Yes, good morning, board members. Um, for roll call, uh, Chair Guyer? Here. Vice Chair Liu? Here. Board Member Balte? Present. Board Member Kim? Here. Board Member Firth? Here. Okay, are there any, is there any oral communication, anyone that would like to address this board on an item that is not on the agenda today? Seeing none, I'll close the public portion and uh, ask staff any agenda modifications, additions? Okay. Uh, with that, you want to go ahead and... Uh... Yeah, so I have to recuse myself on item number one. So okay. we'll leave the room. And yes, because I own property within 500 feet of the proposed project. That's not really, okay. All right, let me, uh, we'll start then with item three, which is 1451, 1459 Hamilton Avenue and 1462 Edgewood Drive. Request by Walker Warner Architects on behalf of RBLKT LLC, SFRP LLC, RFBPO LLC, and JPAWW LLC for major architecture review to allow for the demolition of two single story houses and two two story houses and for the construction of three single story houses and one two story house on four separate lots. Basements are proposed on two of the houses. Environmental assessment categorically exempt per CEQA guidelines section 15302 and zoning district single family residential R1. 10,000 square feet. And uh, so uh, I, I will disclose that I met with Miss um, Kathy Scott um, of uh, Walker Warner Architects um, and just just for a quick site visit and she um, kindly led me through the four sites just to see what the current existing conditions are like. When? Yes, I also accepted the applicant's kind invitation for a site visit. Uh, and uh, was assisted by their project architect, identifying the trees to be preserved and removed, the location of the proposed fencing and sidewalks, the absence of basements, except a little one at 1457, and I also inquired about the expected capacity of the theater, which I believe was to be about, or media room, which I believe was to be about 20 individuals. Thank you. Okay, we have the staff report. All right, thank you, members of the Architecture Review Board. My name is Graham Owen. I'm an associate planner with the city. Uh, I've been working with uh, Walker Warner on, on this project, 1451 Hamilton. Um, so as you, as you mentioned, the proposal is to demolish the existing uh, single family residences on the four lots at 1451, 1457, and 1459 Hamilton Avenue, and also at 1462 Edgewood Drive. Um, major architectural review is required whenever you have uh, three or more um, adjacent single family homes that are being uh, developed. Uh, typically staff handles uh, one and two story um, single family homes, but in this case, uh, architectural review is required uh, by the board. Um, one of the homes is proposed to have two stories, and so staff has done an analysis uh, consistent with the individual review guidelines to determine whether or not uh, the proposal meets those guidelines. And so that's included in, in the staff report, and we have made findings uh, accordingly. So here's an aerial photograph of the site. Uh, the, the location is, the four, the four lots in question are um, on Hamilton Avenue. Here are the three homes that are existing, as well as the home on Edgewood Drive. It's in the Crescent Park neighborhood, and that's a neighborhood that's characterized by larger lots, uh, as well as larger homes. Uh, so it's an R1 uh, 10,000 zoning district, so you typically have 
home, uh, home size, or excuse me, uh, lot size is in excess of 10,000 square feet. Here's uh, a couple of just Google, Google Street views of the surrounding context. Kind of shows that it's somewhat deeper uh, front yard setbacks in the surrounding area, as well as uh, kind of a mix of one and two story homes. Wanted to pull up uh, the, the overall site plan uh, so you can get an idea of the scale. Sorry, technical difficulties. Here you go. So here is the here are the three homes on Hamilton Avenue, as well as the home on Edgewood Drive. You can see here uh, both the existing building envelope for the existing homes, which is kind of in that lighter shaded gray. Um, here you can see it. Uh, this is a this is a pool that would be removed, and then the uh, building envelopes for the proposed homes are outlined with the bold. Um, you can also see a number of uh, existing mature heritage trees, both uh, live oaks as well as redwood trees, that are both on, uh, on all four of the properties. And then you also have a planter strip on Hamilton Avenue where you have protect, protected uh, street trees. Uh, some of those trees would be protected, uh, while two of them would be uh, removed to allow for the reconfiguration of, uh, of the driveways. Uh, as, as mitigation for those two, uh, they've proposed to uh, install four along Hamilton Avenue as a replacement. All right, let's get back to this one. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so I'll start and just kind of briefly go through each of the four homes since there are just four of them. Here's a, a streetscape view showing the neighborhood context uh, for the proposal at 1451. It's a one-story house with a two-car garage, painted shingle siding. Um, as you can see, here's the, this is the proposal ad adjacent that's a part of this development, but this is uh, one of the neighbor's homes uh, that's not a part of this development. Um, there, there is a contextual front yard minimum setback on Hamilton Avenue of 35 feet. So in addition to the, to the home being relatively small in scale, um, the proposal would push, push the, back, the, the home back uh, relatively far for an R1 context. Here's the plan showing uh, the front yard setback, 35 feet. Um, the proposal would also have an accessory building in the rear uh, that's within the buildable envelope of the lot. Uh, here are the two, two replacement uh, trees that would be installed in order to mitigate for the one tree that would be removed, which is a, a red oak. Uh, 1457 Hamilton Avenue, this is the one two-story home that's proposed with this, with this project. Uh, it would also have a basement as well as a uh, second story. Uh, the second story is relatively uh, low uh, compared to what you often see. Um, the minimum, excuse me, the maximum height limit is 30 feet. Uh, I believe that the proposal here is 24 and a half, uh, maybe 24.6 uh, feet in total height above grade. So as you can see, the second story is stepped back from the first story. Uh, the home is uh, proposed to have brick cladding as well as metal roof. Again, with the proposal of 1451, a 35-foot contextual front yard setback, uh, as well as uh, the preservation of matured trees uh, and landscaping throughout. 1459 has a slightly different uh, style uh, with a hipped roof form, uh, but also kind of follows the, the established pattern, excuse me, the, the proposed pattern of having a white, a white cladding as well as a darker roof material. Um, it's a slightly, slightly smaller than the one at 1451, I believe, and you'll have a detached garage uh, in the rear of the property uh, that's just a single, a single car garage. Here's the plan showing the front yard setback, as well as the longer driveway leading to the detached garage. And then lastly is uh, the proposal across the block at 1462 Edgewood Drive. 
uh, which kind of has a, uh, I don't want to call it snout house design, but the, the garage is situated towards, towards the front of the house. And that'll be more apparent um, on the plan. But it's also a, a one story, but it will, this one as well would have a garage, or excuse me, a, um, a basement uh, underneath, the, underneath the building envelope over the first floor. So here's the plan showing the L-shaped plan uh, for the floor, floor plan, and then as well as the preservation of the existing uh, mature trees on the property. There's a couple of key issues that we wanted to just highlight. Um, the first one when we're looking at new homes is neighborhood compatibility of whenever you're going into, a, into a, an established neighborhood. Um, so there, we feel that the, the existing, um, the existing neighborhood was developed between the 1920s and 1950s, and there's a variety of architectural styles that are present in the neighborhood. Um, so in terms of the site planning, the proposal uh, does fit in with the surrounding context, in our opinion. Uh, the architecture is um, it's coordinated across the, across the four homes, uh, but there is variety between the architectural styles as well. Um, I also mentioned that the two-story home uh, you know, is subject to the individual review guidelines, which uh, further address neighborhood compatibility uh, as well as privacy. And so we feel that the two-story home is consistent with the individual review guidelines uh, in a number of ways, or excuse me, in all ways. Um, and in particular, has paid a, a lot of attention to minimizing privacy impacts that could be, um, that could be, that could be present if, if not properly mitigated. And this is done through high sill windows, uh, louvers over the windows on the second story, uh, as well as placement just on the front and rear of the property. Um, also, the, having the second floor uh, stepped back from the first floor um, really brings down the scale of the two-story house. Uh, tree protection, as I mentioned, um, all of the uh, protected heritage trees on the site are going to be retained. Uh, two street trees would be removed, two red, red oaks would be removed and mitigated with four new street trees. Also, um, and we've heard from a number of neighbors uh, in the area about uh, con just raising concerns about construction impacts. Um, there's questions about uh, basement dewatering, ground groundwater drawdown, uh, which would be uh, potentially uh, necessary. Uh, it's not known if it's, if it's going to be um, required for the two basements at this time, uh, but it can have the, the applicant um, provide you with the information that they have at this point. Um, also, logistics and for, for the construction, uh, typically, we do not require a logistics plan until the building permit stage, but I know that the applicant has uh, done some work to, um, to do a preliminary logistics plan, that, which they uh, can share with you today. So we, based on the findings that we've uh, provided in draft form in the staff report, as well as the conditions that we've, uh, that we've developed, uh, we would recommend approval of this project. Um, and we would recommend that, that you recommend approval to, uh, to the planning director. So if anybody would like to contact me afterwards, uh, here's all my contact information and be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Can we hear from the applicant? You'll have 10 minutes to uh, give your presentation. Okay. Okay, hi, I'm Kathy Scott with Walker Warner Architects. I'm representing the project on behalf of our clients. I'm also joined here today by Let's Go Associates, our landscape architects, as well as Shugard Dow, our builders. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture and then we'll have the landscape architects speak to the tree protection we're putting in place. And the builders will talk a little bit about our construction logistics plan and minimizing disruption to the neighborhood. Um, as Graham mentioned, uh, this is a prop project which has four uh, individual properties, um, 1451, 1457, 1459 Hamilton, and then 1462 Edgewood. Um, our goal and our client's goal is to essentially maintain the character of the neighborhood. They bought the property or the original house and these other properties in the neighborhood because they love 
the character of the neighborhood, its significant trees, the very residential scale, um, and the variety of homes. Um, so that's what we're endeavoring to preserve. Um, as Graham mentioned, again, I'll sort of reiterate a couple of these points. Um, the idea is to replace uh, four homes with four homes. Uh, previously, there were two two-story homes um, and two single-story, and we're electing to have just one single-story home and three, uh, sorry, one two-story home and one three single-story homes. Um, one of our big goals in designing the project was to preserve the existing trees on site. As we said, the, the clients love the trees, um, not just the redwoods and the oaks that are protected, but also the ginkgos, the copper beech, uh, magnolias. There are just a number of really stunning trees on this property, and the, the homes were designed to uh, make best use of protection around them. Uh, our goal is to reduce the scale of the homes relative to what was there. Um, these are about 20% uh, smaller than what was what's currently existing on these home sites, and then about 50% of what's allowable. We just we're, Our goal is not to build out the sites to their maximum, but to really uh, maximize the gardens. Um, <clears throat> um, and I should say the previous plan was showing the footprints of the existing uh, the existing homes, as Graham mentioned, in gray, and the existing pools. We're removing four pools in the process and don't propose any new pools. Um, and then we're also showing all the existing trees to remain, as well as you can sort of faintly see some of the ex a few of the existing trees that are proposed to be removed. Um, as I mentioned to Q and Wynn, when we walk through the site, um, there are a couple of trees. There's a, a cedar on 1462 Edgewood, and then a couple of walnuts on 1451 uh, Hamilton that are not in great condition, according to our arborist, John McClenahan. So we are proposing to remove those. Um, this slide shows uh, now the existing homes and pools removed, and it's showing some of the proposed trees in kind of a lighter green tone. So you can see where we're pro proposing to add trees, um, including a number along the street. Um, and I should say that I, I believe we have a total between the two street frontages of eight trees added um, to offset the two we're removing. Um, <clears throat> so again, the idea is to nestle the homes into the gardens, really in keeping with the neighborhood uh, surrounding and to reduce the amount of hardscape and building footprint and pool. Um, again, when I walked the site with Q and uh, Wynn, we, we just made note of just how much hardscape there was um, on the, uh, particularly the 1457, 1459, uh, and 1462 Edgewood sites, um, just really kind of consuming nearly the entire lot uh, in these three cases. So really trying to open that up and focus a lot more on garden space. Um, here is a elevation of 1451 Hamilton, uh, blown up a little bit, um, both before and after the trees are in place. <laughs> um, our goal, again, is to set it within the existing trees. There are a couple of magnolias here and a couple of oaks that are quite lovely, and redwoods at the back. Um, this is one of the three properties that have a white painted shingle pallet, uh, white painted shingle walls, white painted uh, windows and French doors. We have a, a cedar shake roof. Um, and then where we have a solid door, the garage or at an entry, those are stained uh, to be in keeping with the cedar shingle roof. Uh, this is 1457, as we said, the, the one two-story uh, building, both before and after it's set within the landscape. And this home, uh, our goal was that we would make this home a little bit more unique, um, and because you see such a variety of home styles in the neighborhood, that they don't all look um, identical to one another, so this one um, has a palette of white painted brick, uh, steel doors and windows. We have a, a standing seam metal roof. And then up at this higher light monitor, is what we call this, um, the pop-up, um, we have uh, the, the metal louvers to sort of 
filter the light into the building as well as uh, keep the, the roofscape quiet visually. This is 14, uh, 1459 Hamilton before and after the trees. Um, and one of the things, again, as Graham pointed out, we're trying to do is uh, have a diversity of, of massing so that it's just not all the same. Um, and so this one, you can see a little bit better, but without the trees, has the hip roof at the lower level and then a higher gable in the middle. And then 1462 Edgewood. Um, again, you can see before I add the trees, um, one of the, our goals as well was uh, in order to present, you know, a, an attractive facade to the street, we have modulated the building forms by popping up dormers um, in cases. We've added porches. Um, you can see that actually going back here as well. There's a recessed front porch here, same at this property and same at 1451. And again, this one's set well back from the street, so there's quite a number of existing significant redwoods, both on this property and the neighboring property that we're trying to protect and uh, celebrate. And I'm gonna hand it over to Eric Anderson from Let's Go Associates to talk about our tree protection. These properties are home to several heritage coast live oaks, redwoods, magnolias, copper beech, uh, large ginkgo, and all of these are covered and accounted for in our tree protection plans, which have been reviewed and approved by both our project arborist, John McClenahan, and the city arborist, Dave Doctor. Um, and after the tree protection fencing goes up, we'll move into deconstruction uh, rather than demolition, which gives us a lighter footprint. and. We're doing this for all of the buildings simultaneously, which allows us to stage the work to keep heavy equipment away from the trees. The new residences are sited further away from the trunks than the existing structures, and the foundations will be lifted up above grade to minimize excavation where possible. We're leveraging several technologies to ensure that this is as uninvasive as possible, and these include ground penetrating radar to locate the roots to avoid damaging them. Additionally, we're providing geogrid access roads uh, to protect the roots from soil compaction from construction traffic. And we'll also be providing uh, root channels with an engineered soil mix for the new street trees and the existing street trees under the sidewalks. Um, and of course, all excavation will be done by hand or air spade and under the supervision of our project arborist. In closing, I would also like to just add that from the perspective of the design team, we feel lucky to have clients who understand that these venerable trees are irreplaceable assets of these properties. The trees are the focal points of the landscape and gardens, and their protection has been paramount in every design decision. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. We've got, is that left or? All right, I mean, you've got a minute left. All right, okay, you've got a minute. we got a minute. Okay, I'm gonna go fast. So I'm Jim Bickford, I'm with Chukar Dow. We're here as the builders for our clients. Uh, what I wanna do is just kind of run you through. I know we're gonna submit a complete logistics plan with the permit set, but this will just give you an idea of what we're thinking about and what we're doing right now. We've developed a pretty contained site. Our plan is to keep all of the work on the site and not impact the neighborhood by being um, outside the perimeter of the site. Our clients have given us two really important goals. One is to reduce impact on the neighborhood and the other is to do the project as quickly as possible, also reduce the, uh, <clears throat> reducing impact. Uh, we're getting a warehouse off site so that we can prefabricate work and do any mock-ups and do any other work that we can possibly do away from the site. We're gonna have off-site parking and shuttle to bring the work crews in to mitigate any conflicts with parking in the neighborhoods. Saturday work will be minimized to only that work, which is uh, needed to get us done as quickly as possible. So thank you. I think that kind of covers it. Thank you. Uh, anyone have any questions of the applicant? Yes, I have two questions, please. Um, 
I notice your entrance for the construction seems to be at 1462 Edgewood, going to the left of the very large redwood tree there. I'd like to know if staffs, if Dave Doctor supports that. I understand there's a driveway there now, I believe, but it seems there'll be a lot of traffic going past what's a majestic tree. So what, what will be the impact of construction on that tree in the front of 1462? We'll have to take a look at that uh, a, a little closer. Part of what is going to enable uh, the, the project to crawl over tree roots is this Biaxio Geogrid. They're, they're going to be building some temporary roads over the tree roots to get the project built and then take off the geogrid and, and uh, allow for the roots to remain um, you know, functioning. But this, the Edgewood access, we definitely have to take a look at that a little closer. There's, there are several areas that we've, we feel like we still need to look into really carefully with the project. Um, I feel comfortable enough to send it forward with their plans now. There's a lot of little small details with the finish grading and all that have to be still worked out, however. Hope that answers your question. It, it does, thank you. The second question is for the applicant. Um, I wonder if you could just explain to me what the use of these structures will be. Yeah, the use of the structures is essentially what they have been to date, which is residential. Um, the idea is just to expand our client's capacity to enjoy the property, um, sharing uh, time with friends and family, having more outdoor space to play, and, um, you know, they, their current property is quite restricted, and so this is just giving them a sort of an additional space for their residential functions. I'm sorry, I'm still confused. Maybe I don't understand the full backstory to this project because I really don't. But okay. um, do I understand somebody else is going to be using these houses, not people who would be living in the homes? There's four homes. Are there four families living in these homes? Uh, there will not be four individual families using the homes, but a family sharing it with their family and friends. And how is that possible? How does it explain? Tell me more. How does it work? <laughs> Um, well, I think uh, currently what they're using, uh, the, the owner of these homes is currently using the properties for, um, they have a couple of friends living in a couple of the houses, and they are using the others for uh, extend, extension of their living for cooking and dining and entertaining, um, you know, essentially extending their residential functions. Does, does the owner live nearby or something? Uh, yes, the owner lives in the property uh, right here. Thank you. That makes it clear. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I have a couple questions for uh, staff and the applicant. I'll start with staff. Um, it seems to me that some of these homes uh, have covered entry porches, and uh, it doesn't look like they were accounted for in the area of the homes. I don't foresee it putting them over the FAR or anything like that, but I just wanted to ask if um, planning had taken a close look at whether those areas should be counted or not. So I know that there's a second story balcony, for example, on 1457, which is the two story home. Uh, I believe that it was counted in floor area. Is there, were there one or two in particular that you were? I, I'm actually asking about the, the entry porches. So for instance, on 1451 Hamilton, that entry porch does seem to have a roof over it and three walls. Um, I, I know the, the rules can be very picky as to when it's counted and when it's not, but just wanted to see if staff had taken a, a close look at that. Um, it looks as though that wasn't included in the FAR diagram. Uh, you're correct, uh, but we can make that a re revision to the calculation, of course. Okay, um, and, it, and it may very well end up that it's wide enough that it doesn't count, or it shouldn't count, but I just wanted to make sure that that was mm -hmm. looked at carefully. Um, um, an another if I may, yes. I just wanted to clarify that recessed entries like that um, that are less, less than 10 feet deep are not counted towards FAR. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, and then, uh, somewhat of a strange question. Is a washer dryer counted as a plumbing fixture? I'm sorry? <laughs> Is a washer dryer counted as a plumbing fixture? So can a detached garage have more than two plumbing fixtures or is it, is it, viewed, as a, is it viewed as a detached garage or a detached accessory structure? Because my understanding is that detached accessory structures can have no more than two plumbing fixtures. It appears to me that 1459 Hamilton Avenue, uh, that garage has three, the sink, toilet, and a washer dryer. 
Uh, that's correct. So an accessory structure um, is restricted to 200 square, or excuse me, is restricted to two plumbing fixtures without the need for a conditional use permit. So that is, that is a correction that would be required. That's something that has to be addressed. Okay. Um, and then a question for the applicant. Um, this is regarding 1457 Hamilton Avenue. I noticed on the second floor plan that there's a shower off to the very left of the floor plan, but it doesn't seem to show up on the roof plan. Could you explain um, how yeah, that shower works? That's a good question. Um, it's actually tucked underneath the main roof. Okay. Um, we set the, the roof height just high enough that we can sort of tuck an eight foot tall so it's still uh, being eight foot tall. Underneath it, yep. Shower. Yeah, it's right at the okay. ridge, so it's at the highest point. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, those are all the questions that I have for now. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I had a question of the applicant. Is there a laundry um, at 1457, laundry facilities? Uh, the laundry would be in the basement storage room. Just not indicated. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'll turn it over to the public then. Oh, go ahead. One more question for staff or the applicant. What's the area of the lot of what is essentially the principal house in this complex? The adjacent residence. Yeah, sure. So the the lots vary in size between 12,000 square feet and 17,000 square no, feet. No, not the ones we have, the one mm -hmm. that's the principal dwelling to which these have been used as expansions of the residential use. Oh, so the adjacent one that's not subject to this? Uh, I'm not sure. Does the applicant know? We could look it up, of course. We I don't can, know. The, we can uh, find out in a minute. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Okay, I'll turn this over or I'll open it up to the public. Is there anyone that would like to address the, uh, the board on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Peter, you want to start? Sure. Good morning. Um, I have to commend the applicant. This is one of the finest presentations I've seen in a long time. It's an exquisitely put together set of drawings. I really appreciate seeing all the experts, the engineers, the construction, the arborist thinking about it. I find the design of the houses to be very sensitive to the neighborhood. Um, and uh, really just left stuck on one thing, which is pretty important. We need to make a series of findings to, uh, to approve a project like this. And the very first one, is that we have to prove that it's in conformance with the comprehensive plan of the city of Palo Alto. And the comprehensive plan essentially says that uh, this is a residential neighborhood and we want to maintain Palo Alto's varied residential neighborhoods. There's a series of other policy statements. And I've just been sort of thinking about that for the past week since this has been in front of me. Um, and I really, this is the first time I've understood who owns these properties and what the backstory is. And so I'm trying to come to some understanding of what's going on. Simultaneously, I've just been sort of thinking through the, the notion we have of our residential zoning code. And we're so focused on the idea of the maximums, the maximum floor area, the maximum density per acre, maximum size impact on the neighborhoods. But there's also a minimum sense to that zoning code. What it says is you have to have a house, a minimum, a family, a single family residence on each property. And that sort of goes to the core of what Palo Alto zoning is about. That's why it's not Atherton. It's why we have each lot having a house on it. And what I'm finding here when I look through these plans is that none of these are really residential in my book. A residence is something where a family lives. A person resides in a residence. And these are not residences. These are part of a larger compound. This is something you might find in Atherton, a large estate with a series of guest houses, recreational facilities, movie theaters surrounding the house. And I, I, I guess I just really have a hard time coming to grips with that fitting into what really is a 10,000 square foot lot zoning in Palo Alto. We're not creating four new homes, we're removing four homes. And instead we're creating one much larger complex. And I don't know 
were to take that, and I'm very eager to hear what my fellow board members think, but I'm uncomfortable being able to make the finding that this, is in support, this maintains the intention of the comprehensive plan right now. I'd like to just leave it at that, Robert, because I don't want to get into technical details. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and again, thank you for the invitation to, to tour the site with you. Um, I think overall, um, you know, like uh, my, my fellow board member, I said, this has been a very nice presentation, and it, um, it, it doesn't leave too many questions. Um, however, I, I, I can't help but agree with some of the points, maybe from a little slightly different perspective. I think, for me at least, um, while I understand the sensitivity that's been taken to making sure that four individual residences are replaced with four individual residences, I still see some areas where um, they just don't seem residential enough. Um, there are a couple homes where the, the front entry isn't as clearly marked as, as I would expect a typical single family residence to be. Um, and then there are some other, um, you know, small, what, what could be perceived as oddities, such as a, a large theater space in one of the basements. Um, I, you know, I understand and I, I don't have a problem with people entertaining, but I'm just thinking if, you know, 40 years down the line, if a, a single family were to purchase one of these homes, um, you know, they wouldn't have a choice but to maybe convert that space. I don't know if they would continue to use it as such. So. Um, having said that, I think there are still some um, personal concerns that I have with some of the kitchen spaces. They seem awfully small for, for a family to be able to move in and to use um, in, in a modern day kitchen sense. Uh, but, but other than that, in the overall view of things, I, I really do appreciate the, the scale of, of the, the, the homes that you're presenting to us. And uh, I think there's a very unique kind of charm um, that's been presented as far as how the residences work with the trees and the proposed landscaping, um, such that it would continue to feel uh, very residential and very low in scale. Um, let me just go through the comments that I have. Uh, I, I did have a couple more questions. I, I think uh, there are some more details that we need to see, uh, such as the metal louvers um, on 1457 Hamilton Avenue. I, I wasn't quite sure if those are um, windows with metal louvers in front of them or if they're completely opaque metal louvers. Um, I did have also have a question um, as to whether or not maybe the accessory building on 1451 Hamilton could be uh, actually converted to a, a secondary dwelling. I think that property actually has the ability to, to have secondary dwelling units, so I, I don't see why you wouldn't add a shower or maybe the washer and dryer there, because 1459's lot is too small to have a secondary dwelling. Um, I also had a question, maybe you could answer very quickly for me, on 1457 Hamilton at the second floor. Um, if you look to the right of the floor plan where that open to below space is, could you tell me just very quickly what that space is next to that? Is that just a balcony or, so to the right of the landing? Yeah, so on 1457, when you come up the stairs, there is a landing. Um, there's a little bit of an overlook to the great room space down below. And then to the other side, of course, is the bedroom suite. So that's kind of like a, a balcony overlooking mm -hmm. yeah. the, the exactly. open to the room space. Okay. Yeah, yeah it just wasn't fun. labeled, and I wasn't quite <laughs> sure if that was an accessible space or not. Yeah, and then I also wanted to acknowledge the, uh, the letters that came in from the public. Um, I understand uh, the concerns that they may have, but I, I'm also confident that the, the uh, construction strategy that the team has going on um, will try to address those as best as possible. Um, it was also very interesting to read about the, uh, the shell-shaped swimming pool at the 1462 Edgewood property. Um, but I think uh, my comments can be left there. And uh, thanks again for the presentation. Thank you. Wynn? Do you have that area? No. Sorry, my Wi-Fi is going very slow. <laughs> but in excess of 12,000 square feet? I would assume I would so. I assume so, yeah. Thank you. It was an elegant presentation. These are spectacularly beautiful sites in terms of their trees. Um, 
one of the things that I like about this proposal is that it looks like the trees would have a better chance of flourishing uh, once this project was completed than they do now. Um, but I have a threshold question and problem here. There, this, I went back, we don't do a lot of single family reviews on this board, so I went back and I read the comp plan section on residential uses and I read the R1 zoning. This is R1 10,000. Um, I think my colleague, Mr. Balte, has already talked about the purpose of R1 zoning, a comprehensive plan in our district. Um, it's supposed to, you know, create, preserve and enhance areas for detached dwellings, strong presence of nature, open area with opportunities for outdoor living and children's space, um, quality design, second units, uh, minimal community uses and facilities that would reduce housing. Um, there's also a maximum lot size, which is 20,000 square feet. Uh, and it's said that this is so that um, there won't be any net loss of housing stocks or homes that are out of scale with the homes in the surrounding area. We have accessory uses, um, and then we have uh, accessory, which, uh, accessory structures, some of which require conditional use permits. Um, I don't, this site, th these three lots, um, four, sorry, total about 60,700 square feet, which is substantially in excess of 20,000 square feet. When you combine this with what is in fact the principal dwelling of this project, it's even bigger and even more out of compliance. Um, and I can't read these plans for additional dwellings as credible single family dwellings. Um, and I'll take a little time to talk about that. Um, I'm not, you know, we have a definition of a house uh, and it's designed basically for a single household to use it. And it's a group of rooms with living, sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation and bathing facilities, separate and independent housekeeping unit. Um, and we don't define families. We don't say it has to be families of blood or relationship, but we do talk about it being a single housekeeping unit on each of these sites. And these aren't in fact such things in terms of use or in terms of design. If you look at 1451 Hamilton, to take the first one, just a second while I find the right page here. Um, you essentially have two ensuite bedrooms, three washers and dryers, a project room off the garage, and a really nice vegetable garden. And then you have an accessory structure with a mud room, which is an interesting use for an accessory structure, uh, a half bath, and a den family room. Um, when you look at 1457, which is probably the one that's least credible as a single family dwelling, at least this is how I read the plans. I look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say. Um, which sheet am I supposed to be looking at for the floor plan? This is an entertainment space. You have a great room, uh, which is 40 by 30, um, which looks like a great entertainment space. At the other end of the structure, you have a serious kitchen, which because of its location, um, looks like a service kitchen rather than a family kitchen. Um, you have, in the plants that we see, no laundry, perhaps because there's extra laundry next door, and then downstairs, you have a 30 by 40 foot media room. So it's a great place for a party. Um, but again, I don't see it as a credible single family detached dwelling, independent dwelling. Um, when you look at 1459 Hamilton, I have another concern. Um, the existing house is eccentric but beautiful. It makes a little more sense when you know that there used to be a larger parcel and part of its yard disappeared, which is why the backyard is presently full of pool and whatnot, looks pretty constrained. <clears throat> and again, it's two independent guest suites, very modest kitchen, um, and apparently laundry out in the garage, certainly possible, um, but unusual in an R10,000. 
and unusual if you're designing a house for a family. Um, 1462 Edgewood um, is another highly unusual, and I would say not particularly credible, R1 10,000 house as an independent house. And again, I realize these were not presented as independent houses. Um, it's got a great deal of basement storage room, um, a rec room with no light. I think there's no light wells. Maybe I'm missing something. Um, it has two bedrooms, one of which has no bath, um, which is highly unusual these days. Um, it has another, it has, both the bedrooms are quite small, incidentally. It has a bathroom and it has a shower, but no bathtub, and again, a minimal kitchen. And so when I look at this layout, it does not look like a single family dwelling. Um, so why does this matter? I'm not saying houses need to be big. I'm not saying that there's only one kind of household. I mean, I, there are a lot of older houses that were built, for example, for pairs of sisters to live in. You know, Here's my wing, here's your wing, and we only meet for breakfast. Um, but these are not credible single family houses. They're credible as part of a larger compound. And we have zoning that instructs us that a residential use isn't supposed to be, more, an integrated residential use isn't supposed to be more than 20,000 square feet. So I can't make the finding that this is consistent with the zoning, uh, at least as I analyze it to date. With respect to the design, um, I'm concerned that along Hamilton Avenue, um, we're gonna have double fencing, a four foot fence and then a seven foot fence. And I don't um, think that uh, privacy and security fencing is in a, in a, in a, inappropriate in this neighborhood. But I do note that one of the reasons this is an attractive neighborhood is that while there are some uh, houses which are quite secluded and fenced off, these houses at the moment get their seclusion entirely from landscaping. And with none of these houses having front lawns or open gardens, you're going to get quite an expanse of uh, screened off housing. And it might be possible to address that with planting that essentially obscures the four foot fences and with design that changes the uh, seven foot fences so they're distinct. Um, I spend part of my time in West Marin and we have very large landowners there and you can always tell George Lucas's property by the fencing. So I think it would be important to think more about this Hamilton frontage so that it did not look like uh, a compound if you should decide to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, I had the same sort of thing. I started looking at these and they all initially just came across as being unusual designs for residences. But again, uh, and I thought maybe I was, you know, I'd come in here being the oddball thinking that everybody else thought this was uh, perfectly normal and I, I was just strange. Uh, I mean, situations where you've got a living room at one end of the house, the kitchen at the other end of the house, and a bedroom in between. I'm sorry, but that's not a normal layout for a house. And again, it's the type of thing, uh, once you put all these pieces together, it reads compound. And uh, they are actually, it, it's the whole idea of fitting in with the neighborhood. Uh, they don't. I mean, the, the concept of them doesn't. Uh, they really don't respond to the street, they're, they're actually almost too low key. It, uh, it's one of these things where quite often we have to sort of fight someone who wants to put a monster home somewhere. These are almost the complete opposite where they tend to disappear in uh, behind a fence and a whole lot of trees. Uh, I agree, I have a hard time uh, you know, working with, because we have to find that it conforms with the various requirements and I just can't get it to comply with uh, just context in the neighborhood or in fact even the, the what the zoning is. Uh, so like I said, it, it, I have a hard time uh, accepting the way it is. So with that, does someone want to make a, a motion or do you have additional comments based on the fact that you? Well, yes, if I could. Um, I'd like to take a step back and make one other comment that isn't really applicable, but I find it a real shame that we're tearing down four perfectly fine homes 
in fact, more than perfectly fine, stellar examples of residential architecture in Palo Alto. Really stunningly nice houses with no fault, quite valuable. And, and for what reason do we just tear them down? For what reason do we claim that we're a green, environmentally sensitive, ecologically conscious town? You as architects, the same question you should be asking yourselves. Where do we come off just tearing these things down to put up a, a smaller movie theater? It just boggles my mind. Now, come on, we're not here to reprimand the architects. Or... <laughs> okay, well, I'm not reprimanding the architect, but I'm trying to express a sense that I believe many citizens in Palo Alto feel, Robert, that there's just something not right about the way we approach this. I grant you that it's perfectly legal, it's within the ordinance, and there's no finding we can make that would make a difference on that. But I'd like to just put it out there, and I'm sure I'm not the only one sensing that. Um, a bigger thing, back to the question we're talking about, is I think there's a history in Palo Alto, up and down the peninsula, of wealthy individuals building compounds. Of, uh, I, I went back and looked through the Gamble Garden Center in Palo Alto. was originally the home of the granddaughter of the heir to the Procter & Gamble family. Extremely wealthy. Makes Facebook look insignificant by comparison. And back then, that was a very large compound that was created. And over time, it becomes a valued heritage to the town. It's not necessarily bad, what we're seeing in front of us. What I'm bothered by is, is the process and the fact that it's sort of being slipped under the radar a little bit. And it seems to me this is the kind of thing that should have a conditional use permit, perhaps. It should be vetted and reviewed by a larger chunk of the town than just the architecture board. It's not really a matter of the architectural design of these structures. We all know that the structures can fit most of the findings. But um, it seems to me that staff perhaps ought to consider putting this through a conditional use process when you say that this is, these are all auxiliary loose uses to the main property and therefore we should consider it that way and therefore we should open up the review process to be seen that way through the whole town. That way we'd get a broader group of citizens looking at what gets done. The city council might weigh in, which seems to me the proper way for this kind of decision to be made rather than it slipped under by the architecture board. Uh, I'll leave it at that for the moment. Okay, so I think we're all pretty much in agreement. We seem to have some difficulties with this. So how do you want to approach this? My problem is I think this violates the zoning. Um, where in our review of projects does this come up? I mean, I don't see that we have a specific finding. I mean, we can say it by virtue of it being inconsistent with the comprehensive plan, because, but we can't approve a project which is violates zoning. The city doesn't have the power to do that. That is correct. Um, when we were reviewing this project, it was our understanding that these were four single-family homes. Um, they do all have kitchens and, you know, the basic amenities of a single-family home, and that's the way that we were looking at them. Um, we certainly had the same concerns as you, um, but because they all had kitchens, you know, we felt okay moving forward with them. Um, the proposal, they're keeping the existing property lines, um, so they're not violating the maximum lot size. Um, but you are correct that um, in the maximum lot size, it does talk about the purpose of that is to maintain the housing stock. And so um, we'd have to, you know, dig through the comp plan and the zoning a little bit more to, um, and, and sort of be aiming at that direction of not reducing housing stock. And, but that was our understanding is that the project was not going to, to do that. Can I, can I ask a question? I don't know if that's allowable. Is it okay to ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Um, I think my question would be, I think agreed, uh, you know, as we mentioned, the, the use in the short term is for our clients um, to use the properties in conjunction, but the idea was to design them so they could stand alone as individual homes. Um, as she just mentioned, that we have not moved lot lines, we have not proposed any mergers. Um, our idea is that we're leaving each of these properties sort of intact and allowable to serve as a single family home. Um, even if in the short term they may not serve that function, I think the idea is to, you know, make them flexible. Um, I should say we didn't max out the square footage. The homes could be expanded. Um, you know, we essentially just tried to minimize the square footage so we're not impactful on the neighborhood in the short term. But there's nothing to say that someone couldn't make changes to these homes to, you know, make them uh, work for a larger family. I think also to Wynn's point, we, um, 
you know, we, we didn't define a single family as, you know, a mom, dad, and a couple of kids. It could be anything. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people who live alone. There's people who are, you know, uh, just couples. So anyway, we're trying to be flexible and, and not define exactly what these homes are. We just, essentially, we're trying to meet the requirements of a home, which is bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, living space, laundry, and I apologize for not showing the washer dryer <laughs> in the basement. Um, but anyway, that, that was our intention. Let me to answer your question. Uh, I agree that it's subjective, but it is also, that's why there's four or five of us up here, uh, because we all have differing opinions. We don't mm -hmm. look at this, uh, you know, we look at this independently and then come here with our findings. And I think all of us sort of had the same approach that it really doesn't, uh, technically it meets the requirement of a single family house. But if these things were put on the, the market, for instance, individually, you'd have a hard time selling them because some of them are very unusual. In the context, if you take all four of them, they make sense, but individually they don't. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have a concern. There are four perfectly acceptable residences there that do function individually, and we don't feel that these four do. So at that, can I get a motion or the? You can try, I'll start, you can modify. Uh, I move that the board recommend to the Director of Community Development that this project be denied uh, for our inability on the grounds that first it is incompatible or inconsistent with the comprehensive plan of the City of Palo Alto in that the R10,000 district is designated for a minimum of one household per acre and that this is an integrated development designed to serve the needs of a single household uh, on in excess of 60,000 square feet. Uh, perhaps you could find out what the actual dimension of the other one is and put in the correct version. Uh, secondly, that the um, houses that uh, the house located at 1457 Hamilton is not designed, I'm sorry, I tried to find our ARB finding on suitable design, where is that? Um, how about, is not a credible single family dwelling, but is instead designed as an entertainment area for a larger complex. Um, what else do we have a concern about? How, what else would we articulate here? I don't know if we have to get that specific. We Is there just... anything else we should put in? I would add that the frontages along um, Hamilton Avenue are incompatible with the neighborhood uh, in that they uh, present too much of a unified design for a R1-10,000 district with a maximum 20,000 square foot lot size. Um, and basically the problem is the use. Um, do the rest of you find the other houses, credible single family houses? Uh, and that the other homes, which are, I can't quite read my, tiny screen here. What are the numbers? 1451, 1459, and 1462. Uh, Edgewood are not designed as independent single family dwellings, but as accessory uses and structures for the principal house uh, located adjacent to these properties, uh, which if permitted at all would require a conditional use permit. Can I get a second for that? Sure, I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, that passes 3-1. Jody, do you want to go ahead and call Alex? 
call Alex.
900 North California Avenue. Request by Kohler Associates Architects on behalf of Greg, I don't know how do you pronounce that? Chung. Chung, okay. For architectural review of three single family homes to replace three existing homes, environmental review, categoric exemption per CEQA guidelines section 15303A, new construction or conversion of small structures, zoning district singly, single family residential district R1. Can we have the staff report? We do. Good morning, Chair Guyer, members of the Architect Architectural Review Board. I'm Adam Peterson from the Planning Division. I'm here today to present uh, an architectural review request for 900 and 912 North California Avenue and 2205 Lewis Road. As noted, this is a development that proposes to uh, remove or demolish three existing single story, single family homes and replace those homes with three new single family homes. The homes range in size from approximately 3,100 square feet to approximately 4,700 square feet. Uh, as you can see, the project is located at the eastern intersection of the corner of North California Avenue and Lewis Road. It, it is a site that's approximately 30,000 square feet. Uh, as noted, again, there are three existing single family homes. There's one here, and there's one here, and one here as well. Uh, this is the proposed lot configuration. The first lot located at 2205, or the first home located at 2205 Lewis Road, would have access again from Lewis Road. On the right side of the house, there's an attached garage uh, located towards the back of the house with a parking spot in front. There is access from the front of the home to the sidewalk. The other two homes achieve access from California Road, or excuse me, from California Avenue, both have access from California Avenue to the front of the homes. Lot three has a detached garage and an accessory dwelling unit located towards the rear of the property on the left-hand side. I should note that the uh, driveway is configured to uh, conserve or preserve the existing trees in this area. There is one street tree that will be removed per the city arborist direction, and that street tree will actually be replaced with another tree. Uh, this is the streetscape. Uh, again, the top streetscape is along California Avenue. We have lot two on the right, and we have uh, the home on lot three on the left. Again, this is the streetscape on Lewis Road. This is lot one here in the middle, and then the side elevation or the, the California Avenue uh, home that would be in front on, on Lewis Road as well. This is the front and the left elevation uh, for the home for lot one on Lewis Road. Uh, there's wood trim around the windows. The home consists of, has a composition shingle roof and painted horizontal uh, board siding on it. Uh, you can see here that it shows the daylight planes as well, and the home is consistent with daylight plane standards. This is the home proposed for lot two. Uh, again, the rear, the rear elevation and the elevation fronting Northern Cal uh, North California Avenue. You can see that it does have the front, front door here uh, leading to California Avenue. There is a covered porch and a balcony area. Uh, the home consists of a concrete tile roof with five foot window sills on the second floor and obscure glazing on the side windows. This is the front and the side elevation for lot three. The home has a shingle roofing or has shingle siding with a composition, composition single shingle roofing, five foot window sills on the second floor, and there is stone wainscot around the base of the home. Staff analyzed the project and found it to be consistent with the comprehensive plan, the individual review guidelines for single family homes, and also the zoning code development standards. Based on this information and based on this analysis, staff recommends that the Architectural Review Board recommend approval of the project or recommend uh, that the, excuse me, the, that the uh, Planning Community Environment Director find the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and recommend approval uh, to the Planning and Community Development Director based on the, uh, subject to the conditions and findings for approval. Thank you, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, are there any questions of staff? Okay, does the applicant have a presentation? Good morning, I'm Roger Kohler, uh, owner of Kohler Associates Architects. I have my staff with me. Jeff Kuo, Willie Durager, 
Matthew Kohler and the owner Greg Zhang here in the in the orange, and we've been working on this project for over two years, and we have we have now are required to condense two years into ten minutes, which is going to be difficult. So we worked with the uh, owner and the uh, staff uh, over the two last two years, and just to want to highlight um, one of the main things is that the. This project, each home went through the individual review guidelines with Arnold Mamorelia as well. So this is not a just all our our uh, our creation. It's uh, working with Arnold, the staff, and the neighbors, and everything. We've worked on um, providing us these three homes to fit into the corner here, as per the individual review guidelines, as requested by various folks staff and uh, one or two of the neighbors chimed in um, on working on all this. As you can see, it has the typical uh, individual review elements, large uh, continuous one-story porches in the front to, to uh, relate the um, larger homes to the one-story homes in the neighborhood. That's very common of all the IR drawings, uh, homes that we work on. Um, so we've uh, had various meetings with staff, and let's see my um, I think the big thing I just want to emphasize is that um, this did go through individual review, which I don't know how many of you have been through that, but uh, that is a uh, pretty uh, serious process. The neighbors get to get involved, and um, we've done quite a few homes through that program. I'd like to have, um, who's next? Jeff. Jeff is going to talk briefly about the um, other portion. And he's got a whole page here, which is going to have to condense into two minutes. So, okay, Jeff. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Kuo. I'm with Kohler Associates Architects. Um, so I'd like to briefly describe the, um, the project, um, uh, the neighborhood context and char uh, the characters of the neighborhood. And then uh, I briefly described the, the design concept of, the, of all these three homes. Um, the neighborhood is kind of a mixture of one-story and two-story homes, and with mostly one-story on the project of property side, and two-story homes uh, located right across the street on both Lewis Road and California Avenue. And um, there's really no consistent architectural style in this neighborhood, and has a mixture of um, 50 and 60 style homes in some of the a uh, couple of them are 80s and maybe early 90s. Um, all these uh, existing homes, the material, most of them, the roofing material, uh, shingles and composition shingles, uh, wood shakes. A um, couple of them are concrete S tile roof, and most of the homes are stucco homes with some of the wood sidings. Um, so basically, we designed these homes as three individual homes with the idea of uh, three different architectural styles, um, but, and, but with uh, sharing some design, the similar design elements. And so <clears throat> uh, since we have these uh, two, two one-story homes adjacent to um, our property, so for lot one, which is 2205 Lewis Road, and last three, which is 912 North California Avenue. Um, our design concept is we're putting the, the, garage, uh, the driveway uh, right adjacent to those one-story homes and trying to move all the, uh, the building and mass away from the one-story homes. And, um, and all the garages are located in the rear of the house or uh, the detached uh, to the rear and 912, the corner lot, we designed the garage um, in terms of just have the garage door facing the, the real property line, so it's not, you cannot see it from the street. And, um, and because all these three homes are two straight homes, so what we're trying to do is we're locating the upper floors uh, back from the the front facade and away from the street sidelines, so um, so we can um, acknowledge the neighborhood scale and we can reduce the scale, um, uh, the mass and the height 
of the two-story homes. And all these three homes, we have, we have the front porch design. And um, the last one, we have a four width of the front porch design and with the uh, side gable. And oh, on the second floor, we have Hebrew with two gables <coughs> facing the street. And for lot two, the corner lot, which is very visible from the street corners, we use wrap around corner porch, and we use small uh, gable elements to facing each street. And, so, and we, <coughs> we use the uh, we use a wraparound porch, and the, so the entry will be integrated into um, the porch design, the facade design. And for the last three, <clears throat> for last three, and we push the second floor back from the first floor. Uh, we're using gables, a uh, couple gables to add the visual uh, interest and character of the house, and we use single siding and stone wainscot at the base, and the further reduced uh, the massing of the house because it's also right adjacent to uh, the one-story house to the left. And so basically, these are the three design, uh, three individual homes, the design concepts that we have. And also we're by choosing um, the different material um, for the different homes and trying to have a more individual homes, uh, the look and the feel. Instead of a, as a design, as kind of a, a subdivision as a whole. So we try at the, at the mind of the individual homes because it's gonna be individual family gonna live in there. And, um, so we like to have them to feel like they are <laughs> living in a different home instead of just a sub, uh, like, a, like a subdivision, typical subdivision. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions of the applicant? Yeah, Peter. Uh, I have a question of staff, I guess. The applicant said they've been through the IR review process. Could you explain what actually has gone on for the review of this? It's not actually a full IR process, but it is a consultation with our uh, IR uh, architect. And so um, he has reviewed this the same as he would if it was just one two-story home. And he's given his comments um, for you to now take into consideration. But I don't, I don't see any IR comments in our package. Is it fair to assume that, that the IR process would approve this the way it's in front of us, or is that still for us to be judging? Because this is um, three or more homes, uh, it does come before the ARB instead of going through the IR process. But we still apply those same guidelines. And so I believe we had attached. Attachment E. Right. I'm sorry, uh, yes, Jody. So we do have at the that. end, we have the attachment um, from Arnold Mamarella. Thank you. I have a quick question for staff. Um, in the draft conditions of approval, number 3A, as a result of the basement extending beyond the wall of bedroom two, the applicant shall install a sliding glass door or door in either bedroom one or bedroom two. I, I didn't quite understand why that condition was, was made. Could you just explain that very quickly? Uh, so we do um, have a an interpretation of the allowed um, basement under the footprint of buildings. Um, that you are allowed to complete the square um, in two areas where those are under sort of an entry porch or a, a back porch, something of that degree. And so in this particular floor plan, um, there wasn't a sliding glass door or something to that extent to make it an entry. Uh, so the door is being required so that it is an entry because they're, they're under that. I see. I understand that. Thank you. Any other questions? What's the minimum lot size in this district? So the minimum lot size is uh, 
is 6,000 and the maximum would be uh, 9,999. Go ahead. I have a question for, um, for Roger and Jeff. So on, on lot three, which is the um, 912 California, so on the, the garage and the guest house, I was wondering if you could explain the logic of, um, of that and the placement of those buildings and could they, com could, could they be combined or would that be too large of an accessory structure or are there building code issues between a, you know, garage use and a residential use? So you're asking about the separation between the garage and the back and the, and the guest Yeah, house. I just wanted to hear the thought process on, on that. Well, I think it's from our end is that uh, instead of combining them, which ends up with a fairly large building, you have two separate projects, uh, the building. So the, um, it just, I think it's easier on the look of the backyard to have two separate buildings and which allows planting and trees to grow between them. Um, also, makes the living in the house a little more use of that home a little more private and not not necessarily private but it has more of a backyard feel than an attached garage we've done a couple where there's in atherton especially where the good the house has been attached to the garage and it ends up being a fairly large structure because there's no breakup so that's why we preferred to do that yeah it's large it becomes large and then they're kind of funny proportions because they're relatively low because of well, daylight there are, planes there and are stuff. daylight plane requirements yeah. for the structures, and their the maximum height is what, 12 feet. Yeah. Right. And then, and then, I guess just for staff, we have a minimum separation between house and garage. Is there a minimum separation between accessory buildings? There is a minimum uh, separation for accessory structures, which would be three feet. Right. Um, but when you're talking about a second dwelling unit, then it would be 12 feet. And that would be 12 feet from the main dwelling. Right, not, not between the guest house and the garage. Correct. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I can just tack on a question to the end of that. Is there a reason that the, the guest house or the secondary dwelling unit isn't maxed out? Maxed out in terms of size? Yeah, I mean, I, as far as I understand from the code, it could be up to 900 square feet, but it seems like you're, you're at 600 something and, and you're not over, it wouldn't throw you over the, the maximum lot coverage. I, well, I was no, just wondering if there was a reason. There are floor area limits, so, yeah. I, I don't think it would push you over your floor area limits unless I missed a number, but I, I just thought maybe there was a reason. Are you encouraging that everyone go to the maximum floor area? <laughs> I'm encouraging secondary dwelling units that would serve a, a possible second family as best as possible. Well, the maximum second, I think, is 900 feet. Right. Um, so if you look at... Uh, on page if you look A1. at the page uh, A1 for mm -hmm. last three, the four area calculations, um, the second door unit also including in the total four area of the property. So the allowable four area is 47. Ah, uh, I see. I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking at the lot coverage only. You're right. Understood. Thank you. One last technical question. On lot number three, could you tell me the space between the property line and the left-hand side of the house? I see a dimension on one drawing, but I can't read it. Okay, the, the property line to the left-hand side of the house. Yeah, where the driveway is, the width of the driveway easement. Oh, we have a, a 10 foot, 10 inches driveway. 10 foot, eight inches? 10, 10 foot, 10 inches driveway from the left side of the house to the... I, I can't read it, but 10 foot, 10 inches, thank you. For me, I just <laughs> thank you, Robert. Yeah. Greg, would you? The, the owner would like to say a couple of words because he got missed out on. Greg, why don't you come up? All right, go ahead. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Greg Xiu. I know uh, Robert has a difficulty pronouncing my name, so X pronounces as S H I O N G. That will be a little bit easier for you. So uh, I, uh, I live in Palo Alto and a few blocks away from the uh, proposed project site. And then uh, was, because my two kids go, they go to uh, Jordan and Pali. So I, I, I personally am very aware of the intersection of the, uh, the Lewis Road and North California. I pass the intersection almost every day. So as you can see from the survey map, I mean, now it has a three little, I mean, funny, 
built in the uh, 50s, 60s a structure, and on the Lewis Road, it's 700-something square feet. So I rent it out to a tenant and collect a couple hundred bucks uh, a month. Uh, so I don't feel personal because I live here. I'm a, I'm a developer and have done a couple houses in Palo Alto, uh, well received before. But I don't feel it's a good use of that block being on the intersection and being close to, to uh, Stratford and Jordan there. So, and to turn this, uh, uh, I mean, the three uh, the lots combined, this uh, 30,000 something the lot into three houses. And uh, one plan is that uh, I may use uh, one of the houses after it's completed. Of course, I cannot use all of them. So uh, the other two will be, you know, uh, for market. So that's uh, just a little bit uh, explanation of, uh, I mean, how we came from. And I think that's uh, uh, all I want to uh, talk for now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll open it to the public, but I really don't think there's anyone here that wants to address the board, so I'll close that again and bring it back to the board. Uh, Q? Uh, thank you for bringing this project to the ARB, and uh, thank you for your, your patience in the, in the past two years of going through the process. Um, I have just a couple questions. I. I think um, the IR process that you're going through has addressed a lot of the things, but um, maybe I'll just start with just a couple of nitpicky things. On the plans, as I was flipping through, uh, some of the sheets for, for lot one, for instance, have the wrong address. It says 2221 Lewis Road. So you know, just, just a couple of things to clean up there. Also, I noticed on um, 900, North California Avenue, sheet A5, um, at the master bedroom balcony. It looks like part of that roof plane shouldn't actually be there, but I, I just wanted to make sure that, that that's being shown correctly. And, and again, it could be my mistake, but I just wanted to run that by you. Um, but I think overall, um, this would dramatically change that intersection. Um, I, I appreciate the the owner and developer, uh, you know, giving his background on this intersection, and um, you know, as somebody that's attended, you know, Jordan myself, and has, has biked and walked along here several times, um, and I, I definitely think this this would change the intersection a lot. I think some things that I'm still interested in seeing um, are maybe some some three D site perspectives showing these three homes in relation with the other uh, single or, sorry, single story homes that are neighboring it. Um, I know you do have this this beautiful hand rendering on the cover sheet, but I, I think it needs to have a single view, a single perspective showing the relationship between these homes and, and their surrounding homes as well. Um, these are, are, are large homes. Um, it's not to say that it's not allowed by the, the total square footage or, or lot coverage, but I think considering the size of the homes, I, I think these are, this is a comment that somebody else will probably make as well, but the, some of the, the workings of the home maybe are not things that I, I personally like. You know, the, the garage placement, for instance, on lot three with that side entry. Uh, maybe it's not lot three, it's lot uh, two with the side entry. Um, things like that bother me a little bit. Um, I think, you know, these are really big homes and yet uh, lot one and two only have a single car garage. Um, you know, I, I understand that many homeowners, especially in Palo Alto, don't necessarily park in their garage, but I, I do think we should try to, to encourage it to a certain extent or at least make it a little bit more accessible for, for a car rather than just keeping to the minimum sizes. But again, those are, are very personal comments. Um, the garage and the guest house, the detached garage and guest house on lot three, I think could use a little bit more thinking. I, to me, they look um, a little bit of an afterthought. I understand that that, that lot with the re, uh, readjustment of the lot line 
um, kind of configures itself to, to, to do that, but I, I do think that there could be some additional thought put in there, and um, it just seems like the, the homes are, you know, have been designed so intricately, but the garage and the guest house especially has just been kind of plopped on there as a box. Um, I, I may maybe just come back at the end once I find the rest of my comments, but uh, but otherwise, thank you for bringing this project to the board. Okay, Alex. Great, thank you. I very much like the uh, the, the design of this project. Um, I think the the porches, in particular, the corner porch, are really very desirable, um, and I think would make the neighborhood a better a better place. Um, the and I think too also just the the. I think you've blended in like the two-story mass into with you know with the one-story hip roofs, and I think that helps um, tie it into the neighborhood. So really, I, the, my only issue I think on the project is the um, is the lot three guest house, mm -hmm. and really my concern, my main concern was just the privacy to the house, the existing house in front of it, right? Because that's their backyard is looking out to the side of the guest house, and it's only six feet away from the property line. So my main concern I, I, um, is just a buffer, and maybe it's moving the building back so that there's adequate landscaping, maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's a, a taller fence. I think there's a taller fence being proposed to replace the existing five-foot high fence. Um, but that's really my main concern there, that, that and I don't know who I don't know if the um, if the neighbor has an opinion. The, the existing resident there has an opinion um, on that. Um, so, is it? It looks like a rental property, maybe, or I don't know. It's not in great condition, but um, that's my main. That's really my main issue on this project. So, but thank you for that. Were you going to have a comment or something? No, we were just going to say that we haven't received any neighbor comments on this project. Okay. When? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for presenting this to us. Um, I agree that this is going to be quite a transformation of that corner. Um, whether it's desirable or undesirable is, is a separate issue, but it's not going to um, unobtrusively slide in. Um, my most serious concerns have to do with lot three. Um, and to staff, I can't find guest house in our glossary. Is that a term we use? A second dwelling unit. So it would be good to mark these as second dwelling units so that we would understand what standards we're supposed to be applying. Um, I think the biggest, I mean, this is really the, um, the relationship between lot number three and 920 California is really the most problematic. That's a relatively small, low key house uh, and you're surrounding it on two sides uh, and you have two-story structure, a narrow driveway, um, and then an accessory dwelling unit right next to it. So I would have trouble, I couldn't make the finding that it adequately addresses that neighboring issue. Um, I think it requires significant screening landscaping uh, on the, um, what is that, the northern side, which might require widening that, which would require, I believe, widening that driveway, which might require moving the building over, which might require moving the proposed lot line over. Um, but I think it could be done and I think it's needed. Um, and I think the same thing with respect to the accessory dwelling unit. Um, my other concern on that um, parcel is that, staff, is it correct that one of those covered spaces is required for the accessory dwelling unit? Correct. The code requires one, uh, one, one parking space in the garage and then one parking space outside of the garage. When you have shared garage uses between two separate uses, I think you need shared you need divided garage space. You need separate. You need a dividing wall and you need two doors, not a single garage that's never going to be. It's, it's unlikely to be used uh, as the code requires. So I would not want to approve it without having a bifurcated garage. Um, that was my principal concern. I'm a bit concerned that um, the design of the house makes it look bigger than the square footage needs to look. Um, that may be the price of interesting and articulated design. 
Um, but I was interested that the replacement houses that have been built along California so far, even the two-story ones, um, don't leap out. They, they uh, are set back. Um, I think probably the IR has done a good review. They've been low key. And another thing that concerns me, and I'd like to hear from my colleagues about this, is that I don't see these structures as being that different. I see them as looking quite obviously built as a set of three um, because of the roof forms they use, because of the, it, it, to me, it does seem like more similar to um, the subdivisions I grew up around where you could pick, did you want Cape Cod or Craftsman on the basic design? Now, I may be wrong, but this is how it perceive, I perceive it. Peter? Thank you for your application. Um, I share Alex's sentiment. I think that the houses are relatively handsome and I think will fit into the fabric of the community reasonably well. And I especially like the, the wraparound corner porch on lot two, as well as the plaster finish, I believe I'm reading with the curved eave detailing and stuff. I think that gives it a, just a, a tad of a notable corner thing on a house, which is important to have. Um, I guess I don't quite share Wynn's sentiment about the houses not being different enough. It's true that they all have gabled dormer ends, but I think that they're, they're clearly individually designed for individual circumstances. Um, overall, I can support the project. There's one issue I have with, with lot three, which might be significant, in that I think the uh, driveway space is just too narrow. I think you need more like 12 feet at a minimum, because I really do think you need a row of landscaping on the left-hand side of that driveway to the neighboring home. The, the existing home, I guess it's 920 California, to the left of lot three, um, is, a, is a modest one-story structure that will be sort of overshadowed by this home. And it seems at the minimum, we should ask for a row of landscaping along the edge of the driveway. Additionally, because you have a guest house or a second dwelling unit and the garage in the back, for that driveway to, to really be used, it needs a little bit more space and more breathing room. When you give us the landscaping buffer and you make it the bare minimum eight feet, it actually will be very tough to go down that. People will be scratching their car on the, on the porch and stuff. And I really would like to see you try to just narrow the house a little bit. You'll have room in the back to, to keep up the design. I don't think it'd be that hard to get a minimum of 12 feet clear and then put a landscaping buffer along the side. I do also share my colleagues' concerns that the, the guest house and garage in the back don't seem to have been thought out very well. And um, they could stand another round of design. All that said, I'd like to appeal to my colleagues that um, it seems almost unfair to be taking these guys through yet another round of design stuff on what really is reasonably well-designed stuff for us. They've been through the ringer on IR. It really has been a while. I'd like to see us push this along, perhaps with the condition of making a few small changes rather than continuing it again. So is it possible to do a, um, to approve a project and then have changes come back on the consent calendar, which we haven't done in a long time? Um, or, uh, or it could go to the subcommittee yeah. for review. And um, in the past, I think if, I think if we thought it was the, um, my, if it wasn't really like massing, um, we would send it to the subcommittee or consent. Um, and in this case, though, I would say that the, if we're talking about the massing of the guest house in the garage, um, it's sort of iffy. It seems like that between the daylight plane, they can't do a lot back there, but it's mostly landscaping and buff, you know, if it's landscape and shifting things around, um, you know, we could probably do the consent calendar or subcommittee. I'm mostly concerned about getting 12 feet where the driveway goes, but. I think they could change the floor plan around easily enough and staff can check the details. I think it's a clear enough direction that staff can handle that kind of change. And then if we want to review it, we could go to subcommittee. I mean, worst case, that's taking a foot out of the building. That could be modified enough that you're not really losing anything in the, uh, and I mean, it is a new building, so it's not. Uh... Well, maybe should we hear from the applicant if that's, well. Well, I tell you what. Uh, we'll, we'll... Let's... Basic, I mean, I pretty much agree. Uh, you know, it is one of these things that I get a little nervous about the fact that, you know, one of these actually ends up being a six bedroom house and the other one ends up being a five bedroom house <clears throat> with a one car garage. And I mean, and that just seems, uh, 
you know, an invitation of having cars all over the place. And it, uh, that part I don't really like, but there's nothing in the code that says that that's not allowed. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the same thing. You've made, you know, uh, quite a few changes to the positive in our opinion. And so it, uh, and they are, they are large homes, but let's face it, they're not the only large homes in that area. Most of the newer ones going up in that whole area are two story of similar type of configuration. So it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's an area in flux. Uh, like I said, I just do have a problem with, with that, but, and I guess I could push the issue to context or, or you know, how it fits in the neighborhood, but uh, it seems like you know, the, uh, there's enough opinion here that uh, probably this should move forward. So why don't, seeing as though you were the one that wanted to, uh, why don't you come up with a, a, a motion? Sure, I move that we make the findings in the staff report and approve this project with the additional uh, finding that um, the house be shifted so that there's 12 feet minimum space between, house on lot number three be shifted so there's a minimum of 12 feet clear space between the property line and the house and that there be a landscaping buffer installed on the left-hand side of the driveway. Um, and that the design of the guest house and garage in the back come back to the architecture board subcommittee for a final review. You want to classify it where it gets enhanced somewhat? In other words, comes up to the quality of detailing well, I'm to hoping the I can get a, residents? I'm or? hoping I can get a friendly amendment from one of my colleagues who is more concerned about that issue, Alex. Okay, can I get a second? Or is someone want to? Oh, I will second that motion. Okay, all those in favor? Could I, uh, could I, oh, sure. Could I offer a friendly amendment? I don't know if anybody else supports my view that when you have a garage supporting two separate dwelling units, it should be, I mean, what's unusual about the site is they are under parked. Um, it should be two separate garage you entries. you have a problem with that? I don't think that's right. I've never seen that been required before. I mean, I guess we could debate that well, question, I think, you know, but we're I don't at, think we're, it's... We get to look at the functional use of something, and I think these parcels are generally under parked, uh, and I think that, uh, I, guess I, should, I guess I should not approve it if that's what I think. Um, because we are supposed to no, talk sorry, about the adequacy of that. I, 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 I see no support for this, that. so I will withdraw it. Okay, so again, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. No. So it passes 3-2. Thank you. Thank you. Who was the other no? Well, Oh, yeah, me. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't the Lone Ranger. I have a conflict on the next one. Lucky me. Well, I'm not. Anatomically impossible. Okay, item five, 252 Ramona Street, request by Carrasco and Associates for major architectural review of a proposal to demolish one existing single story residence and construct a new two story building with two residential units. This item was continued from the April 16th, 2015 ARB hearing, environmental assessment, approval of an exempt under section 15303B of the California Environmental Quality Act, zoning district, two unit multiple family residential district and neighborhood preservation combined district. 
Can I get the staff report? Chairman? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we have two people that need to recuse. Or why don't you go ahead and then? Yes, I uh, will not participate in this project because I have a home within 500 feet. Thank you. Um, I unfortunately will not participate in this project um, due to the city attorney's recommendation of uh, any perceived conflict. Okay, thank you. Staff? Uh, good morning. My name is Ranu Agarwal, and I'll be doing the staff presentation for uh, 252 Ramona Street project. Uh, the project, it's not moving. Let's see, let's go back. Okay. Uh, the project is, uh, project involves the demolition of an existing single story residence and the construction of two-story building with two residential units. It has been reviewed by ARB on two other occasions, and this is the third time it has come in front of the AR ARB. Uh, the key issues on this project have been uh, uh, architectural design and contextual compatibility. Uh, in uh, the last ARB hearing on April 16, 2015, ARB had provided some comments which are listed on page two of the staff report. Broadly, these comments uh, spoke to the mismatch between the finishes and the overall appearance of the building. Uh, ARB felt that the overall appearance was severe and the materials that they applied in round two were softer and it wasn't stylistically coherent. Um, uh, the ARB also felt that part of the severity uh, of uh, the architecture had to do with the fact that the building was excessively tall and unnecessarily tall. And the third um, concern had to do with the materials that were used in the landscaping and site design where the ARB found that the uh, site itself became too busy because of the application of a number of materials. The applicant has made some changes in response to ARB comments, and I'll get to them in a minute. But uh, before that, I'd like to give you some background. Uh, this uh, site is located in the RMD uh, NP, which is the two-unit uh, uh, two multifamily district with the Neighborhood Preservation Combining District. There are a total of four lots in that designation, uh, there are three lots to the northwest side of this side, which are in the designation. Uh, the context, uh, so in the neighborhood preservation district, design review by ARB is required. And the purpose of design review of properties in that uh, designation is to achieve compatibility of scale, silhouette, facade articulation, and materials of new construction in this case with the surrounding properties within the combining district. Uh, the context itself of uh, the uh, site in the neighborhood preservation combining district is up uh, in some photographs uh, uh, of the uh, neighboring buildings. So there is a building which is a single story building next to the uh, site which uses elements of craftsman style building. I don't know if it is very clear uh, up uh, on uh, is the Airbnb able to uh, see that uh, buildings there? Yes. Okay. So, and then the building next to it is again a single story kind of a boxy modern style building and then the building next to it is a two story with really steeply sloping gable roofs and a shed roof over the entrance. Uh, the next slide shows the design uh, progression uh, from uh, th that has been previously reviewed in its current proposal by the applicant. Round two was the first uh, proposal reviewed 
which uh, uh, was uh, greater in height and overall massing and scale. There were materials used which uh, the ARB found were uh, uh, not necessarily comparable with the surroundings. The second, which is round three, uh, the scale massing didn't change, but there were softer materials that were applied to the buildings, which uh, didn't seem compatible with the overall scale and massing. It seemed it was severe. The current proposal is the one which is round four, and this is what the building looks like now. Uh, so this is uh, uh, less uh, tall, or the height has been re reduced by about four feet, eight and a half inches. The eaves have been lowered. There is some variation in the facade treatment uh, with uh, the canopies over the porches. The applicant has reintroduced metal, and there is introduction of glass railings over the upper floor roof decks. And some of the um, uh, architectural uh, uh, elements which were borrowed from the building next door, like the uh, wood brackets for the porches, they have been removed. Um, in staff assessment, in terms of scale and silhouette of uh, this building, uh, it's uh, more appropriate in its context, but with regards to material and finishes, there can be some improvement. And staff has placed two conditions uh, on the project to uh, replace the steel elements with wood elements and to um, incorporate shingle roof instead of standing seam metal roof. Page, uh, as far as the uh, site design is concerned or materials used in site, there has been no change. So, the, uh, uh, so on page six of the staff report, staff has uh, made some recommendations for ARB consideration for additional adjustments which could be incorporated in the conditions of approval. Um, the staff motion is to uh, ask the R to recommend approval of this project to the director uh, based on the findings, which are included as an attachment to the uh, staff report and uh, conditions of approval. This uh, concludes staff presentation. I believe the applicant has a presentation as well. Okay. You'll have 10 minutes. I don't think we have their presentation loaded. I'm sorry about that. Um, we can wait a few minutes or we can keep going. We're doing okay. Why don't we take a five minute break then and uh
Why don't you go ahead? You've got 10 minutes. Uh, good morning, members of the board and chair. Um, this is Rachna, who was the designer on the project for the last two and a half years. Um, the, as you can see, the progression that we've gone through, the first one on the left is what we originally hoped for. Um, it's consistent with our modern style, and I think we got several uh, feedback, both from neighbors as well as from staff, that it was too harsh and modern. And so we transitioned it. The next one was the next uh, iteration, softened it a, a bit. Um, we got comments from the board saying it, there were too many materials on that one. It doesn't show up on this slide, on this picture, but it does on the next one. Um, the um, next iteration was softer, but the board mainly said that there were two uh, guard towers were, I think, Robert's comments, and so we removed those and lowered the height, which was mainly uh, Randy Pop's comment. So we lowered the height, which is now about 30% lower than the existing height limit. Um, and use materials that are sort of compatible with my neighbor, who is a friend of mine, Skip Justman, who recommend that we use brick, and we, we like the brick, and I like him. So uh, this is our latest iteration. We, we want to go to the first one there. Uh, as you can see, the buildings next to us, it's the one on the, on the top left-hand corner. The house that we propose is right next to it. Uh, and so we kept it simple initially, but um, the internal houses are a little bit more decorative, and so we've sort of blended it between this one and the middle and the ones next door. Uh, the one, the block, uh, incidentally, it's also about five feet from the setback, which is and the house or apartment building across the street and on the corner of Ramona and and um, where is it, Hawthorne, Everett, sorry, is, uh, has no setback. Uh, there's varied setbacks. The maximum setback in this neighborhood, in this street, seems to be about uh, 20 feet and the minimum zero. So it varies from zero to, to 20. Uh, appropriate for a narrow street. Um, so that then is the context and the materials. The, so the main, concent, main concentration that the board had was on the compatibility of materials and the building height, and we've done both of those, uh, reduced, looked at those concerns and changed the proposal. Um, so these are the more detailed side elevations of the two, uh, of the four proposals to, to now. Uh, this is more pictures, again, this elevations. The one thing that staff has talked about is changing it from a metal roof to a, to a comp shingle, and I think we are okay with that. What we would like to keep is the, the window mullions to be a brown mullion because it keeps the window shape more dark and recedes, rather than the white as staff has suggested. And I would re also really like to keep the metal uh, C channel around the, um, the porch. I don't have anything else other than you know the context and you know the proposal. Rashna, you have anything else to say? Um, I think. Uh Hi, my name is Ratna, and I work at Karaskan Associates. Uh, 252 Ramona, I think the primary issue was always with the scale and the materials. So I think uh, coming with all the iterations, we have come all the way from the first round to the fourth round. The f current fourth round is like the most harmonious when it comes to the material, if you can see. and. Uh, that, that is based on all the feedbacks we got from the previous comments. So, and we've also tried to bring down the scale of the entire building. So all in all, it's like a update on the traditional take, I can say.
Thank you. And we've corrected the stair head height issue. And, uh, Here's, here's the context if you, want, if you need it. You can see the, the setbacks of the existing building um, and the buildings within this district. I don't have anything else. Do you have questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions of the applicant? <laughs> Not at the applicant, again, of staff. If you could just indulge me, I'm the first time I've reviewed this, but this is in the neighborhood planning or preservation overlay, and I'm wondering if you could explain it, the logic of it. It seems four buildings on this block, but not the apartment building to the left are part of that. And are we supposed to be looking for compatibility with the other three houses to the right or with the whole block? We should be looking for compatibility with the whole neighborhood, um, but the NP overlay um, does want you to also, uh, you know, the purpose of that district is to maintain the visual and historic character of the existing neighborhood. So it's, there's a little more um, of, a, of a historic character that we're trying to maintain in those areas normally, um, but you still want to be compatible with the entire neighborhood. Thanks. It's also completely because it's not a hist it's not a historic neighborhood. Like it's not Professorville, right? So it's correct. It's, it's just trying to historic with a small age. Yes. <laughs> it's it's a tricky. When this project first came to the board, that was our that was we had we had the same question. That's why I'm just trying to catch up to speed. I have questions, Tony. Like, why don't you go ahead and I have nitpicky questions. So, um, so on your roof plan, you're saying um, future photovoltaics. Yes. And I wanted to ask about that, and then with also with because your neighbor have, has trees, and also the staff is asking to change the roof material and the conditions of approval. Um, so I was wondering what your thinking is on that. I, I mean, I think that I like metal roofs with photovoltaics, because they sort of blend, they harmonize together. Um, and then also for staff, the condition of approval just says um, the standing seam metal roof shall be replaced with a shingle roof. And it, that could be interpreted as like a cedar shingle roof and not, not necessarily asphalt shingle. So, um, so I think we need to clarify that. Yeah, we would like to not use asphalt shingles because it's not sustainable in the produce greenhouse gases and so on, and carb reduction of carbon. The last few houses that we've done is zero net, net mm -hmm. zero houses, and this will be about, about a 35 to 40% close to zero. Uh, but the photovoltaics is changing so fast that we don't know the product yet. Uh, we will determine that product when, it, when the time comes and we'll bring it to you if you need. Okay, and then do you have, um, so I think I saw on your site plan where you're putting like the electric meter, um, I didn't see the gas meters. There's no gas. So there's no gas at all. So you're really, so it's not the, because we have lots of net zero projects that use lots of gas. Yeah, right. that's bad, not a good thing. Okay, um, okay, thank you. Okay. So you wanna go ahead and Okay, so um, so I, I would just preface my comments by saying that I think the the, um, the NP overlay district is very confusing, at least on my side of the board, because it's, it does talk about preservation of ex existing um, structures, and um, but they're not historic, and it's yeah, it seems f f fairly tricky. And then it's only on these three small, is it like the three or four small houses on the block? Um, so it's it's very tricky. Um, I think the uh, the reduced height and massing I think helps a lot on your project, and then there is a mix of styles, and I can kind of see in terms of massing that I can see it blending in with the neighborhood. Um, I do understand the staff's concern about the materials um, that it is different than not just the block but like downtown north, 
Um, I think on one of our previous hearings, though, I did say that like, I walked around the whole area, and there are a few cases of like houses that have steel and glass porches, and it fits in with the neighborhood. Um, so I can, I think I can accept some. Of, I can, I can like if you, if you feel very strongly about the sea channel on the front porch, I can, I can, I can go, I can go there. Um, it seems a little bit. I think I sort of understand the staff's point. It seems like a lot when you're saying the C channel and the metal roof and the glass railings and whatnot, then you know maybe it goes over overboard. But um, mm. uh, but I think I'd be I can be a little bit I can be flexible on that. So um, my main questions then really get down to the landscaping, and you don't have a um, landscape architect on board, right? No, we don't. We so, did it ourselves. Yeah. It, it, which is pretty, it's pretty simple. I mean, the front yard is uh, turf, which is plastic grass, or some version of that uh, with drought resistant, and it'll evolve over, over time, right? It's going to change. Uh, the, the only important part is the four foot hedge. That was my main, yeah, the hedge, and then um, between the driveway and your, the neighbor on the right. Right, and then you have the Italian cypress trees. It, yeah. Those are the neighbors. Those are the neighbors. But we're going to enhance that with with the hedge. With Skip Jessman, we've gone through a landscape plan on his property. Okay, and then on your landscape plan, you're showing. It looks like a huge tree, but I'm not sure. Is it not back near the garage? But is that not there anymore? That's been removed. It was on Skip's property, and. He used our property to remove it. And right, it's taken out. And then you're taking out the existing garage, yeah. right? So there'll be a sort of much more open area back there. Yes. So it seems to me that there may be room for, uh, and I, I didn't look in the backyard, um, but uh, I guess my question is, if maybe for staff, or if anybody, or if any of the other board members have gone to, the, I didn't go through to the backyard on this site, but my main issue would be. Uh, privacy issues to your neighbors because you do have the balcony on the back unit, mm -hmm. um, and that there's adequate screening um, if it, because it's potentially looking into somebody else's backyard. So, uh, so that's where I'm on this project. I mean, I think it's I think it's approvable, and then let's just debate all the um, the materials. Okay, Peter. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'd like to say I did go through the, the past records and looked at all the, um, the videos of the hearings and stuff. I wanted to really give you a fair hearing that um, I'm trying to be consistent with what everybody else has said. And I have to completely agree that the building was too large to begin with, and I think it's come down to where it's just barely acceptable in my book as far as the height goes. It's still a tall building. You have a very tall main floor, but I can buy that it's, it's compatible on the basic massing level. I find I'm quite attracted to the street facade with the metal roof and the windows going up just under the eaves. The way you've presented it here, I think, is, is quite handsome. Um, I have two concerns. So one is one that came up repeatedly in the past, and that was the access to the garages. And Alex and Robert and Randy, when he was on the board, repeatedly made the same th consider request that you consider pulling the garages two feet back to get more space to turn into them. And it just seems to me an obvious thing to do. I don't see any reason looking at the floor plans why you wouldn't do that to get a little more space in there. You're, to back out in a 20-foot space is really challenging. I understand that the garages are slightly wider than they would otherwise be, but I just find myself not convinced that you couldn't get that extra two feet of space for cars to come in and out. It's such a premium in that neighborhood. Um, I'm not sure where that leaves us going with it, but I strongly support trying to get you to do that. I think that, yes, there's no particular requirement, but as I look at the, the report here, you're asking for a design enhancement exception regarding the driveway. Seems to me that some give and take is appropriate then in that no, case. I but I just don't understand why you couldn't just shift the garages two feet further back, shift the whole middle part of the building. It seems to me it's a fairly simple set yeah. of architectural changes. If I could finish, though. Yeah. My other concern, which is perhaps bigger, just is regarding the second floor balconies. Um, on both the front and the back unit, but those seem to me to fly in the face of our individual review guidelines these days, that it, especially the back one is a large balcony looking across the neighboring yards. And I just don't see where that comes off being acceptable. Um, certainly on a 
single family review through the individual process, that wouldn't stand a chance of being approved. And so why do we allow it in both cases here? Um, I understand that you have a row of cypress trees and it seems that you're in good terms with your neighbor, but um, I just have a fundamental problem with both of those large balconies. Um, they yeah. really are something somebody could spend quite a bit of time on and if I were living next door, I would feel my privacy is in jeopardy. So those are the two issues I have um, and I think if we can come to some modifications on those issues, I can support the project. Um, I'd like to see us approve this, but again, I'd like to see the garages shifted over two feet and I'd like to see something done about the balconies. Do you mind? <clears throat> Thank can you. I, can I ask? Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, it, it's one of these things, if the garages get too difficult to use, people don't use them and it, it, uh, and it just ends up being a wasted space. Uh, as far as this whole thing with the shift or changing to a shingle, I mean, I don't think the design really works with a shingle roof. It, uh, I mean, it is a fairly, uh, you know, severe exterior elevation, but I think at least all the pieces work together as, as they are now, rather than uh, trying to put a shingle roof, and especially, you, I think you were commenting it wouldn't be a composition or you don't want a composition. So, I mean, it, uh, that would, to me, seem really strange. Uh, one of the things I think that could help a great deal is, is, the, is the color is also, I mean, just a stark white is really, uh, well, okay, I mean, it's, it's. Uh, I know it's white in the drawings, but it's. Okay, well, that's quite a bit different, as yeah. you said. The, the drawings do, sh the drawings look yeah. white, yeah. but the. But okay. the all right, well, still, it, it, uh, you know, maybe if you could soften the, the colors up a little bit, that would help. But, and uh, I do agree that the, the, the balcony upstairs still do look, uh, I mean, I, I think I or, or somebody made the comment, it looks like a, uh, you know, a turret and it, uh, or a guard tower. That's what it, the last ones looked like. You've toned it down a great deal, but they still somewhat look like that. So a little bit of softening up on that. Uh, would be would be helpful. Uh, I don't have a problem with trying to get this, you know, done today or whatever. But uh, I, I don't think it's worth coming back for a new uh, for a whole new meeting. But the way it stands right now, I'm, I'm gonna I would need to see some modifications. So, can we hear from the applicant now? He was trying to say something. Me? Can I can we can I hear the applicant wanted to respond to something? Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two great questions from Peter and from you too, uh, Robert. Uh, the first one is the backup distance on the, on the garage. We used a 1977 code in Palo Alto that has not changed. When the, when the opening of the garage space is 10 feet, you only need a 20 foot backup. And that's what we have. And the n new cars can back up in one, uh, much tighter has a much tighter turning radius than, than the old Cadillac CTS, which we used here. Um, secondly, the, I think the, new, the as we move forward, cars are getting smaller, and the turning radiuses are getting much better than the 1977 code. Um, on the, on the uh, issue of the um, railings and the glass, the glass railings and privacy, um, there's a great book called Community and Privacy by Christopher Alexander. It talks about how in, in more urban areas, there's less privacy and more community. And, and so that this balance between community and privacy, I agree in the single family neighborhoods, it, it's not appropriate. As you get closer to an urban kind of living, people don't mind and, and sort of appreciate other people in their vicinity. And so this balance between community and privacy is important. Now, I'm not saying that I'm the author and know all about this uh, amount of privacy that we need, and I'm open to, to the railing being a little bit more, less transparent. Um, but I think urban areas are different than single family. Well, I mean, that's you know, a difference we've talked about uh, in 
other situations also where just using the word urban, you're going to have uh, people that say you're crazy. This is not an urban environment. So, I mean, it, it, they consider urban downtown San Francisco. And other than that, it's, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, so, I mean, yeah. even right. that sort of thing, uh, a term like that yeah. is, is very gray yeah. in this community or, or just in general. So it, uh, but like I said, it, it, you know, I, I agree that those garages are awfully tight and it, it's usually the, the type of thing, if something is too tight like that, people just aren't gonna use them. And you said cars are getting smaller, but I don't know, a Tesla is a pretty big car and that's a, uh, I mean, I'd hate to try and squeeze a Tesla in here. I mean, as a smart car or something, sure, but it. Uh, right, but a Tesla should, has a better turning radi radius than a Cadillac CTS. It's still a big car. It's a big car. You know, so. And garages are 10 foot six wide. Anyway, so how, how do we um, well, I, I, I'm dismayed to hear your response, sir, honestly. Um, we've repeatedly had the same issue. I'm not born yesterday. I worked for years on an alley where I had a 20 foot wide alley and I had to back into a nine and a half foot garage. My new Tesla can't do it. It's too tight. And I don't appreciate just being told you think it works. The question to you really is, is it possible to relocate the garages two feet further back on the property? I look at it and think it is, but it you're is. the architect. And secondly, are you willing to consider that? Um, the issue on privacy, again, it's not for me or you to judge that. There's codes right. and standards in the town, and we're trying to enforce them consistently. And this is not consistent, I believe, with current standards of practice regarding privacy on second floor balconies. So I, I really don't want to debate what Christopher Alexander says. I've read and I'm quite familiar with his work and I might well agree with it. But right now the question really is what Palo Alto standards are. And yes, I'm, and I'm, I'm finding that I have a hard time. I agree with you. I don't see any reason why they can't be pushed back two feet. So let's address that question. Can they be pushed I'm, back two I'm feet? I'm open to both issues, the community privacy issue as well as the garage. So, if, if I may, uh, just regarding the balconies, um, I understand the discussion you're having, but our standard solution would be to put um, either you know five foot solid railings, um, and I just want to make sure that is that the type of solution that you're heading towards, or, or what would be the an acceptable solution? Yeah. I guess I don't see a solution. I, don't, I think five foot railings around those balconies would be, my guess is unacceptable to the architect. And to me, there would be visually a pretty big change to what's a delicately designed building now in the front, that certain front elevation. I guess my feeling is that the front balcony is probably not permissible there. It's just too big an impact on privacy. The back one should be strictly on the back of the building, not the side. And again, there's some sort of privacy screening, maybe a metal lattice or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with both of those. But I feel a little bit like we're sitting here designing this forum because it's the third review. But can we give the code? Because the IR is different, and this is not a single-family house. And my my under my recollection is on in our regular. I'm trying to think of our, our um, in our normal contextual. Standards, right? But do those apply here? For, I mean, that's normally in our downtown district, right? In our, in our more urban districts. I mean, it just says to minimize privacy, does it not? Like sight line, there are sight line issues if you're putting a commercial, if you're putting in like a new commercial building next to a residential zone district, we're supposed to minimize the sight lines into the property. But I'm not sure that that applies in this particular district. I just want to make sure we understand. Which I want to make sure that we understand that we're inf applying the right zoning standards. Correct. I, I don't. We we don't have the contextual guideline requirement Right for here. the zone. Would you? Uh, are the um, IR standards the closest thing? Because those don't apply here either, right? Or do they? My apologies, we don't, this is like the only RMD project that I've, and I've been, that I've seen and I've been on the board for a long time, um, so I'm not that familiar with the requirements. So we do have uh, individual uh, review 
uh, requirements be applied to uh, single and two family residents in the RMD districts. Okay. For those, well, it's for those sides that um, are adjacent to other single or two family dwellings. Okay, which on the right, yeah, on the right side, you, we have, a, there's yeah. a single family house. And so in this case, you know, when you're talking about privacy, then actually the individual review guidelines do apply. Okay, so then I think Peter's, and then I think the, the I think I'm with um, Peter on this one. I think that that's a, then it is an issue. So, okay, and then on the garage, Tony, what is the, the take on the garage is that you can't move it at two feet? Hard to move from a practical point of view. Um, you can fit a car into an 18 foot space. So if that's possible, um, I'm, I can move it back two feet and most cars, all, well, I think every it, car will fit. It needs to be 20 feet in depth on the inside, but I'm talking about taking the side on the, the left side of the building and bringing back two feet there too. Pushing it yeah. back into the side yard? Yeah, well you have two feet to the setback I believe. It looks like you could fit that. There's that's a, why I'm confused about this whole issue because it seems to me a no-brainer every step yeah, of the way. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, just push it back. Yeah, I don't think we're asking for a, a variance or anything, it's just to the setback. Oh, I see, and then you step, the, step it back up above. Well, again, that's why I'm uncomfortable saying that because it's really a design thing. I wish you'd come back to it after the third suggestion. Um, but it, it seems to me that it could be done yeah. with a minimum of change. No, I agree. And then did staff review, did the transportation review the driveway back up? Uh, yes, there was transportation review on this and uh, the backup under uh, three family residences, they are not uh, uh, requiring uh, their uh, standards uh, that apply to three family residences with two family they didn't necessarily they said that the space was tight but it was not something uh, that was uh, something that could be controlled with standards which apply to three family they're not very robust standards below that okay. for backup space So I think the uh, I think the garage issue is doable. And how about the uh, the balcony then? Yeah, I think the balcony is a problem if it's if we're applying IR standards, right? I think in normally in multifamily and stuff that uh, normally we're fighting to get balconies on buildings yeah. to make them <laughs> n nicer buildings. Right? Well, yeah. If you've got a big four-story apartment block, right. you, want, you want the balcony well, even right. though you don't these have are, These are very modest well, yeah. scaled homes. Having a balcony is really quite nice. It's yeah. an important feature. Uh, I'm feeling stuck here. I'd, if I were the architect, I'd be pushing very hard for these balconies. If I were the neighbor, I would be opposed to them. My, my neighbor is okay with it, but I see a point. I mean, I, I can easily put a roof on that balcony. That, that area, and because there's, well, a, there's a lot of open space on this. Look, I've been yeah. through you know, dozens of individual review projects in Palo Alto. I can imagine Arnold, he's the architect who reviews these, saying to me something like, give me a full height lattice screen on the entire width of the balcony, the part that faces the neighbor. That would be some sort of a metal screening that gives you a real sense of privacy between you and the neighbor that you could grow plants on or that you can't see through. We've built many things like that. What Jody said is the current standard build a solid wall five feet high. I could see architecturally maybe not doing that, but some sort of a metal lattice yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I can't say if that's part of the design of the building or not. That's your job. Um, but that kind of thing would be a solution. I could also see just saying eliminate the balconies, although I can understand why you don't want to. Um, but I think it is incumbent upon you to find some way to make it so you can't stand on that balcony and easily look into your neighbor's yard, which is sort of the standard that's being applied. Um, the standard is reduced a little bit when the yards, when the balconies are smaller, when it's not something you can sit and have a glass of wine at night on, which is what this is. This is big enough to really spend time on. So it's a more Im imperative that you find some way to do that. I suppose I'm comfortable saying that we approve this with the condition that it comes back to subcommittee to verify the garage relocation and some sort of privacy screening that meets staff's uh, review on these balconies. 
or that balconies be removed altogether, if that's sort of what we're looking for. I can, I can support that. Okay, I can go there too. And then I just want to make, mention, just remind you that, that, that there's under the conditions of approval, staff had made changes regarding the materials mm -hmm. and the roof. So if we want to modify that, we should also include that. Well, in I, I, I think the metal roof is superior. For yeah, the, I, I, I don't want a shingle roof yeah. on this. I think it's not going to fit at all. That's and really going to look like a compromise, and it, uh, it's not going to help the design. And I, I'm very, uh, architect Carrasco has a good reputation in town. I think we should give him a little bit of rope to choose the color of the window mullions, kind of brick he puts on the building. Uh, it looks to me like it's going to work pretty well the way it is. So, so it's the roof colors, and then they're also Propose the staff is requiring them to change all of the. the well, the colors are also very cold. The col colors are cold, and the, they're also they're, um, the staff conditions are to replace all the steel with wood, on all of the trellises and porches and all of that. I, I so I don't think that would be a good idea. The wood will will fade pretty quickly. I'd, I'd rather see a little bit warmer color that uh, would work a little bit better in the neighborhood. I believe. Okay, so we could ask for a revision to the color palette to come back as well on consent. Okay. Okay, so we're saying the color, but then we'll strike the materials for the well, a warmer porches. color. I mean, warmer uh, color. Right. Um, and then under, so this is condition of, of approval. Oh, well, we need, why don't we make a motion? All right, why don't you do that first, so then we can. Okay, okay. Make I move motion. that we will um, approve this project, making the findings necessary in the staff report with the following additional conditions. One, that the garages be shifted two feet further to the left as you're facing the building from the street, such that you'll have additional two feet. It would feet be the south, basically, I guess, at, uh, sort of? Um, sort of at an angle, so Well, north, south, <laughs> southwest, to the okay. southwest side. Um, the intention is that, well, that the garages be shifted two feet further. Secondly, that um, either the upstairs balconies be removed or privacy screening be provided on the, uh, the side of the balconies facing the neighboring properties to the side. And thirdly, that the color palette um, be revised to be uh, warmer tones. Uh, and these, all three of these should come back to the subcommittee. Yeah. You want to go? I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And I just want to confirm that we are not um, changing the roof um, or replacing the steel with wood. Thank you. Okay, it appears that we have no items for the subcommittee and we have no approval of minutes then I guess we're adjourned. I just want to mention um, that the council uh, debated the um, modifications, revisions to the ARB findings earlier this week. This is Monday night. Um, and then they, uh, I tuned out after 11.30, but they went until midnight. Um, and I think they, they continued the hearing. So they did not, they did not decide on that. Okay. And that's been going on for two, two years.